You're listening to Season 8 of Bionic Planet, now brought to you by Vera, the world's most widely followed environmental standard. This episode is also made possible with support from Conservation International. Sponsors do not participate in the production of Bionic Planet. 20 years back, rain season was almost given. Asinga Matthew, like most of the people we're meeting in this series, grew up in southern Kenya, where the Chulu Hills delivered clean, cool water for as long as anyone could remember, even during dry seasons, even during droughts. But 10 years back, the springs along our area, they had dried up completely. They dried up for reasons we learned about in episodes 86 and 87. The trees atop the Chulu Hills are part of a cloud forest that pulls water from the sky and infuses it into the ground. They also provided timber and charcoal. Eventually, timber harvesting and charcoaling pushed the cloud forest to the brink of collapse, just as demands for water were increasing. The level of water dropped up to around seven meters. Wilbur Mutua grew up here too, and he's among the many who have devoted their lives to saving the Chulu Hills, in part by persuading people to quit the timber and charcoal trades and shift to more sustainable ways of making a living. So it was so important to know this need to keep off the chulis, stop cutting down the trees, and instead innovate other different means of getting their income. But isn't that what we're all trying to do everywhere around the world? How do you get people to fly less, drive less, and change their jobs? It is hard to push people to get out of that hill where somebody has lived and has been used to getting what the, the food, the meat, mm -hmm. they depend on the, the, the natural things. Victoria Musioka grew up here too, and she says the key is to meet people where they're at and apply the lessons of the past. In episode 86, we learned that the Kenyan government tried relocating people decades ago but failed, while earlier efforts to promote sustainable ecotourism and other sustainable businesses delivered intermittent success, but not at the scale needed to save the hills. Then came Red Plus, which stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, plus enhancing carbon stocks. According to Red Plus, they did not get it there, like no. pushing out people so harshly. It didn't push them out? No, they just talked to them and showed them the positive way, and they have given them the assistance they need so that they can see, apart from what you get there, you can get something in so much. The Chulu Hills Red Plus project, like most of the Red Plus projects I know of, succeeds by acting as a massive education training and financing machine that works through existing governance structures to spread climate awareness and then help people overhaul their rural economies over periods of time that far surpass election cycles and aid packages. All these projects seem to start with some variation on a common theme. We have created a slogan, we conserve Chulu, Chulu take care of us mm -hmm. in a later day. Yeah. Did people get it right away or did well, there confusion? For the start, it wasn't easy mm -hmm. because uh, cutting down the trees, burning charcoal, it was one source of their income. They buy food, they pay school fees. By the time we started initiating this program, it was really difficult and challenging because we are trying to take off what they depend on to just spread a gospel which they don't see the benefit in the right, in the right beginning. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know it's ugly face, we should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth, we broke it, we own it, and nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields, and not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? 
technology, geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet, or is nature herself the answer? That's the question we address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we address it by continuing our tour of the Chulu Hills Red Plus project in southern Kenya, the third of three episodes from that project and of at least ten from Kenya more broadly. In each installment of this series, I'll be focusing on one or two components of individual projects. And today I'm looking at the fundamental challenge of getting individual people and entire communities to change their relationship with the land. Something I first addressed in Episode 7 of Bionic Planet way back in 2016. I'll be rerunning that episode in our next installment, so don't feel you have to go digging it up. For today's episode, I traveled outside the project area to an area called the Otivi location. Now, this is important because it illustrates a little understood aspect of Red Plus, namely that the human impacts often stretch far beyond the project itself. That's because in order to save forests in a small area, these projects often have to help people in a larger area. These projects typically begin by identifying the so-called agents of deforestation. In this case, people in surrounding areas who are burning and chopping trees for charcoal and timber and asking them what it would take to get them to stop. The answer is almost always the same. Better jobs for the adults, better schooling for the kids. But those specific jobs and livelihoods vary from region to region, as we'll see today and over the course of this series. I'm Victoria Musoka, the secretary on this area representing the Otiti location. You're the secretary of the Red Project or of the group or who? Of the group representing the okay. Otiti location. Okay. Yeah. How long have you been involved in the in the Red Project? Mm, since mm, I've three, three to four years now. You're the secretary. Yeah. Like, what if, what do you do, and what you know? How has it impacted you directly? What has been I have it. I have been so much engaged to the people of the community, and we have talked about the Red Plus and maintaining the Chulu Hills. How it is going to help the environment? How it is going to improve the standards of the living of these people around here? How big of a change was that? Like before, how did people think of the Chula Hills? Like, and how did that transition take place? How quick was it from? You know, looking at the hills as a as a resource to looking at them as something to be protected. At first, it was really hard because people they used to get in there mm-hmm. and do hunting. They used to survive, thinking that on surviving with the chulu, it will only help on the way of living, getting food, getting firewood. It was a very big challenge, you know, to change people from what they believe in mm-hmm. and how they live. It was so hard. Yeah. How about you, though? Did you, did you, had, you had to change your mind too, right? It was difficult. <laughs> it was really difficult. I used to trek two, three kilometers from the park. Mm-hmm. So I used to, to walk. I trekked so much. Mm-hmm. So at first I, I felt disappointed. It was so hectic for me. But when we got the scholarship, now it motivated us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I saw how the, it has improved our area and how children how people are getting used to it and they are getting it positively. So it motivated me so much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for you it was seeing the scholarship for the kids, right? Or did you yeah. get a scholarship too? No, no, but I've seen most of my neighbors mm-hmm. so needy, they are they are not they are improving on their living. It is hard to push people to get out of that hill mm-hmm. where somebody has lived and has been used to getting what the the food, the meat, mm-hmm. they depend on the, the, the natural things. But according to Red Plus, they did not get it there, like mm. pushing out people so harshly. It didn't push them out? No. They just talked to them and showed them the positive way. And they have given them the assistance they need so that they can see, apart from what you get there, you can get something and so much. And that is what made me to be so motivated with the project. 
Victoria touched on several themes we'll be exploring in this episode and throughout this series, such as the link between education and climate change, the need to meet people where they are, and the need to deliver benefits quickly and then consistently over time. This last one looks like a no-brainer, but as ambient economist Mbisa Moyo and others have pointed out, people in developing countries have been left in the lurch by an endless string of missionaries, NGOs, and even their own governments. So they'll only make lasting commitments to those who have demonstrated a willingness to do the same. Sami Mwatu has been observing this dynamic for decades. He's the retired school teacher we met in episode 86 when he described the government's struggles to relocate people in the 1990s. He says the government also tried compensation payments, but the process was cumbersome and bureaucratic. We had not received any compensation from the uh, government, okay. although there were applications surrendered to the national government, mm -hmm. but uh, compensation used to take long. Mm -hmm. Even they could also take 15 to 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's why people could not respond positively. Right, right, right. But now they have seen benefits through this project, mm -hmm. Red Plus project, Okay. after carbon sales. He says the project has succeeded in part because the partners behind it had already demonstrated a long-term commitment to the region. The Kenya Wildlife Service and the Kenya Forestry Service, though government agencies, are famously incorruptible. While the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust, the Big Life Foundation, the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, and the local school group branches have all built up decades of goodwill. Mwatu himself is a respected elder who now heads one of several umbrella groups outside the project area. But he says the concept of carbon finance was still a difficult one to convey. I asked him how people responded when they first heard about it. They could not believe. We had no such uh, things before. They were not sure whether they are going to be given any sort of help. But when uh, the wildlife staff and the, the partners, uh, which were brought by our coordinator, Banamutuku, is when uh, this conversation started. By wildlife staff, he means the staff of Wildlife Works, a for-profit company that began with the mission of saving elephants and now develops Red Plus projects around the world. Wildlife Works didn't develop the Chilu Hills Red Plus project, but it developed the nearby Kasigao Corridor project, which we'll be visiting in the weeks ahead, and it helped get the Chilu Hills project off the ground. All of the partner organizations shared a commitment to making peace between humans and wildlife, in part by compensating people for damage done by elephants, which have a habit of invading villages to get water, especially during droughts. One way to end that is to build water tanks for elephants out in the bush so the massive beasts have no reason to invade the villages and then to rebuild the village tanks that the elephants destroyed. Through the conversations we have received from the partners and the Red Plus project, there are tanks mm -hmm. to replace those which are damaged by elephants. We have got passeries issued to our students. We have beehives. This, it means that we are getting compensation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the community is also responding mm -hmm. and they are taking care of uh, the environment up in the Chulu Hills. The forest has also come back, the animals have also come back, and the, whole, the community as a whole is also responding because of the help we are getting from the uh, Red Plus project. Mm -hmm. We are harvesting hive honey, mm -hmm. and from the honey we get sales. Mm -hmm. and from the sales, uh, we get uh, some money as an income. These three locations, despite being outside the project area, have received hundreds of hives and weeks of training and support, while each village received new water tanks. We are given uh, 180 pieces of beehives, uh -huh. Zambani 100, and Utivi 100, a total of 308 now in the area. Mm -hmm. On the side of the tanks, it replaced, it's replacing the, the damaged ones. And Dongoni was given one tank, Zambani one tank, Utidi one tank, a total of three tanks. And we have also visited the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, water is also serving our community. Mm -hmm. So we have no problem on that side. On that from the Red Plus project. That's critical because the region is now experiencing a crippling drought, one far worse than the 2009 drought we learned about in episode 86, the one that dried the springs to a trickle. 
As we learned in episode 87, the springs are flowing again because the project revived the cloud forest. And these are some of the activities that made that revival possible. In addition to the beehives and water tanks, there are scholarships or bursaries that pay for high school and college. Bongoni in phase one were given, given 49 students, phase two 28 students, a total of 77 students in the Bongoni location. Zamban we have got phase one 20, and phase two 14, a total of 34 students. Mm-hmm. And then Otiri, where we are right now, phase one we are given 21 students, phase two 14 students, a total of 35 students. The grand total for this region is 146 students, the three locations. How old are they? What's the age range? Between 14 and 18, 19 years. That's because the government does fund primary school, but high schools are private and pricey. Although government funding for scholarships does exist, those scholarships are usually awarded based on clout rather than objective criteria. With Red Plus, the community votes on how to distribute the funds, and it also elects people from its own ranks to distribute scholarships based on what people need and not on who they know. We have got another funding from the county government to deal with the scholarships and the embassies. Mm-hmm. But the system is cumbersome. It cannot be relied on. If you are not campaigning for the MP, your child cannot be considered, although she or he might be needy, but they consider other factors. So when uh, this project came in, People are also rejoicing because uh, we follow the criteria of, uh, first of all, the needy students mm-hmm. to start with total orphans. And the need will be also considered by the panel through the chiefs and the management committee. Then the management committee of the Red Plus headed by Bwana Coordinator Mutuku. So we follow justice mm-hmm. and we tend to, uh, uh, to, to, to be very transparent. Later in this series, we'll hear from people charged with administering bursary committees in the Kasigao Corridor. Thanks to support from this episode's sponsors, Vera and Conservation International, as well as you, my listeners. I'm still producing Bionic Planet on a shoestring, about one-tenth the budget I had for weekly radio shows 20 years ago. If you want more and better episodes, you can help me deliver them by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash bionic planet. That's patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Bionic Planet. There you can support me for as little as a buck an episode and with a monthly cap. The address again is patreon.com forward slash Bionic Planet. That's Bionic Planet, all one word, no dots or dashes. Also, if you're an ethical business looking to reach a global audience, you can advertise on Bionic Planet or become a sponsor as well. You can reach out to me directly at steve at bionic-planet.com. That's actually how Conservation International became an occasional sponsor. Finally, you can help just by giving me a five-star review on whichever podcatcher you access me through. That helps because the more stars I get, the more ears I get. And the more ears I get, the more minds I can reach. And we must reach hundreds of millions of minds if we're to meet the climate challenge. We can do it if we all work together. Now back to the Otiti location just outside the Chulu Hills Red Plus Project. This again is one of three locations that Semi Mwatu oversees in the buffer zone outside the project area. And it's comprised of 10 community groups overseen by Asinga Matthew. Right now we have in my location 35 students benefiting from a Red Plus Carbon Project. Mm-hmm. Number two, we have 10 uh, community groups who have benefited from beehives. Mm-hmm. Each group benefiting with 10 beehives. Okay, so that's so 100. A total of 100 is yeah. within my location. Number three, in partnership with our coordinator here and other government officials, KWS and K- KFS, we have been creating awareness to the residents of our location and even others beyond our area of coverage. And mostly the inf- information we are giving is that which concerns matters about our environment. Mm-hmm. Why do we need to conserve our environment? Right. The need to conserve our trees, especially the indigenous ones. The need to keep away from our chul hills mm-hmm. because to us it is of more benefit. Right. Because it is a, a, a water resource center. We just as we, we, we count it as a 
catchment area. Through that chill hills, water flows from upside to downstream. Mm -hmm. By so doing, the awareness we are creating to the residents, it is to know the importance of keeping off the hills as, as a water catchment area and to make people know how many trees we cut is how much danger coming towards us. Yeah. So one thing we have created a slogan, we conserve Chulu, Chulu take care of us mm -hmm. in a later date. Yeah. Did people get it right away or did, well, was there confusion? Uh, for the start, it wasn't easy mm -hmm. because uh, cutting down the trees, burning charcoal, it was one source of their income. They buy food, they pay school fees. By the time we started initiating this program, it was really difficult and challenging because we are trying to take off what they depend on to just spread a gospel which they don't see the benefit in the right in the right beginning right right but now as we are going on now they are seeing the importance before like some years back 10 years back there are springs along uh, our areas yeah they had dried up completely mm -hmm. but nowadays water is flowing yeah we now visited they can one of open those, yeah. up their eyes so oh. it was so important to know this need to keep off the chulis stop cutting down the trees and instead, mm -hmm. innovate other different means of getting their income. For example, through us as a committee within the location and other locations, through the partnership of our coordinator here, we gave them to know the information that in a later date and in not in spread duration, like now, their children are benefiting. Yeah. How much they could cut down trees to pay school fees, it was just a minute, very small. Mm -hmm. But now, fees is paid for a certain child full per year for the four courses, for right, the four right. years course. So now they are now getting to know. They yeah. are seeing the importance. It is becoming now positive. Yeah. So, But those early now, years must have been tough because people you're asking people to give up their income. Yeah. And then you're telling them that something's going to come from carbon. Yeah. They didn't know what carbon was, I they assume. They didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> it was really well, challenging. Did you know? I mean, how did, how did you know? Were you Did you study this or you just learned it? Or how did you pick? How did you? No, through these programs. And initially, the first beginning, I had it 2016. Mm -hmm. Through organization, the chief called okay. us. We, are go, we go to seminars. So through then, mm -hmm. we now get the information. Mm -hmm. And repeatedly... We have had those workshops. Mm -hmm. We have learned. Now, us as a committee, we organize a committee of around right. 17 members along mm -hmm. the whole location. Mm -hmm. So, from each corner, there is, for example, this is our partner here. Okay. This is a beneficiary for the groups. Mm -hmm. It's the farthest corner, mm -hmm. almost 70 kilometers from here. 70, 70. Seven, 70. Oh, okay. right, 70 kilometers from here. Okay. There is other, there's another person from the other farthest corner. Mm hmm. So we are spread all over. Mm -hmm. So as a committee, we started uh, gradually giving the information to our residents locally. Mm -hmm. To a tune, we came now to mobilize people and uh, public barazas. Mm -hmm. Now we start creating the information through the chiefs, mm -hmm. through elected leaders, so that now we can disseminate the information. Slowly, people have yeah. started learning. So I may say as at now, at least we have some percentage yeah. uh, growing up. And how the, I still keep getting fascinated by those early years because you, people really had to take a leap of faith, right? They had to, like, what was the hardest part about getting people to, to buy in? What were the earliest changes that were implemented? And how long did it take for the benefits to materialize? Yeah. As for us, we already told the people who we are dealing with, the community members, one, it may not be uh, a short-term benefit. Mm -hmm. They need to understand that. Mm -hmm. But for the, for the meantime, we, they are now seeing the benefits through groups benefiting, through their children getting to school. Yeah. And we're letting them know how initially, like some years back, like 10, 20 years back, mm -hmm. rain season was almost given. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we had, we have two seasons here, rain seasons around this mm -hmm. place. There is the long seasons, the long rain seasons, which now was ending last month, mm -hmm. almost this month. Before it could rain normally, and the people knew by October, mid October, 
long rains were coming. Mm -hmm. They prepared for their shambas, they planted, they were evident that they will at the end harvest, mm -hmm. even the short rains. But as from last 15 years down the side, eh, mm -hmm. that has changed d greatly because it is not certain that mm -hmm. we'll experience the rainfalls. It's mm -hmm. not certain. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go even two, three years, no rain at all. Right. Now that people are seeing now this difference, they have seen water flowing, the springs are there. Mm -hmm. Now they are becoming to know, they are getting to understand. In a very short while, we will resume back to our normal when rains could come on our expected dates. Right. Yes. Two, through our coordinator of programs, we have let the community members know the program is running for a long duration. Mm -hmm. So as time goes on, more benefits will be coming. Peter Kameo Madufa represents one of the communities that receive beehives. He chairs the Chulu Base Environmental Server Group and says he first heard of Red Plus in 2018. His group received 10 beehives in 2019. So what he says, he says as a group mm -hmm. and uh, even neighboring groups, they were called for a baraza through the administration, the chiefs, mm -hmm. coordinated by our programs coordinator. And uh, when they came in public, it was now given the information. They were asked, the, the, the partners introduced themselves, who are we? Then they now were asked to give out their needs. What do they want to benefit from? Mm. One, Chulu Hills, and the, there's a Kibwes forest mm -hmm. just neighboring this place. So they, ha they, they said, us, we need first education to be supported, two, creation of jobs, mm -hmm. job creation, and the groups to be supported so that they can uplift their, themselves. Okay. So through then, they created interest because they heard that you leave Chulu, we will support you. Okay, so I'm going to try this way. He says, as a group, they proposed to be supported through education. Yeah. Because initially they were cutting trees to pay for school fees. Two, they said, there are young ones who have gone to school, be employed. So that mm. at least there is some earning at Indafors. Eh? Number three, the community groups to be supported. Mm -hmm. So that because... Some of them have some projects which have been going on, like planting trees. There is a rearing of goats. There is things we call table banging, where they borrow some cash to do some things. So they, they asked how the groups can be supported. They will appreciate. That is why they created interest. And now since then, they have been partnering every program, outreach program. They have been attending. And by so doing, it has come up to this place. Gotcha. First, they have benefited from those beehives mm -hmm. and others from the group have even benefited by getting school fees for their children. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So there's a there's a uh, follow up question then that's you know he had to take a leap of faith. He had to trust because it d wasn't immediate. Like you said, first you stay out of the hills, and this will come later, right? I mean, how, why did he trust? How did he, like how, how did he make that decision? Because that to me is a hard decision. You're asking him to give up something, to get something later. How hard was that decision? to make and why did he do it? Why did he, you know, believe, why did he believe it, I guess, would be the yes. thing. He says, I have been working with the one, they have a lot of trust with our administrators, mm. the chiefs, their son chiefs. So because the Baraza, they were called, the chief called the Baraza. Mm -hmm. So they trusted because their chief is somebody they believe and they trust. Right. Yes. Okay. Two, because they had not even had it before, what has been happening before, some other partners were coming, proposing things, and just going. But now through the chief, he promised through those public bar barazas that believe this one will happen. Mm -hmm. Because there are partners like uh, KWS is a government entity. KWS is a government entity. So through that, they now started believing things will work out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you had to first get the chiefs. So... It's like a, it's a stepwise approach. Is the first the project went to the chiefs, and the chiefs went down, and then okay. Did he he used to support himself by getting charcoal? Now it's beehives. You know how how has his life changed as a result of that? Oh yes. He says before 
when they were taking uh, charcoal burning as their only source of income, that which they could get, it cannot be compared by what currently they are getting from Red Plus Carbon Project because the beehives, his group has uh, harvested twice. His group. His group is what twice? Harvested twice. Harvested twice, okay. Yes. The first round, they got uh, 24 kgs mm -hmm. honey. Round two, they got 15 kgs. Mm -hmm. So what they planned, they, part of it, they sold. The income was greater than how they could burn chakos. Right. Number two, now that at Radom, the children have been picked, the much is getting to school fees is more greater than what they could get from. So they are seeing a, better, a good advantage. They see it better compared to them. Okay. And Sam adds that if more can be supported to the groups, mm -hmm. they will appreciate much and they will be patrons and the propellers of the information. Right. That let us keep away from Chulu, let us save our trees, let us plant more trees. Okay, great. Yeah. And has he also noticed the tangible ecosystem benefits we talked about, the the water coming back, the rains? I mean, is that, I know you had mentioned that. Has he felt that as well? Can you uh, just ask him if he's... He says, now people are understanding. Like some years back, it was totally becoming dry. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, they can believe there are springs. They are neighboring Omani Springs. Mm -hmm. Omani Springs is there. And that's where we were? Bef that's where we were? So they have seen now Thange, mm -hmm. now what is flowing. You see Thange is just across this location, just the other side mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. road. Yeah. The uh, neighboring spring, Omani water springs, it is now flowing. It is the one which serves water all through up to Mtituande. Up to near Savo. Okay. That spring. At this point, Wilbur Matua stepped in. The rivers and the water springs coming up again. We've got one of the major springs, which is under KFS. It's mm -hmm. being managed by KFS. And also the Shedricks Wildlife Trust. That is the Omani Spring. Mm -hmm. The spring, it had already gone to an extent of we could not get water along the towns Makendo, Kibwezi, Kambo up to Mtito. But of as we speak now, water is flowing. There is the Kibwezi River. It dried up. Is that the one, I think when you, when you were little, when you were a kid, you used to not be able to cross it or something like that, and now, then it dried up completely and now it's come back, right? There are other, there's several. I'm just giving an example like right. the area we were, that's the Thange. Mm. We've got Kibwezi River. You remember where we t you took breakfast? Yeah. There's a river there right. which dried up, Yeah. which is... Origin, it's the Omani Spring. Okay. We've got Makindu, one of the oldest wetland during the railway line construction. Water was being taken from that spring. The, the level of water dropped up to around seven meters. But now it's overflowing. And all this is the impact of Red protecting plus. the chillers, which is under the Red Plus project. Oh. We've got Mtito River. The same. The same. All originates from, from Cholo. Okay. The origin is called Ndongoni. The meaning of Ndongoni is a spring. Okay. That's the, where the name comes up from. So it's just amazing all these springs have been bouncing back to life. We've yeah. got Kambo River. It's amazing now. Water is flowing. Mm -hmm. But there was no water around 15, 10 years ago. Inception of the project around uh, five seven years down the line benefits are there rivers are back again plenty of water all is well <laughs> yeah and the first step of the project was getting people to understand yeah yeah awareness the concept yeah. Of the yeah. yeah 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 okay and now they are seeing the benefits. you had talked about when you first heard of it you said you thought it was witchcraft or something like that oh yeah <laughs> that happened in one of our our uh, brothers the outreach uh, program that we go around uh, the community, giving them the information. And during then, mm -hmm. when that concept was not in the community's minds, they mm -hmm. never understood the story of uh, carbon stocks, selling carbon, bringing funds back to them, getting education to their students, buying BI. They could not understand how oh, this is crazy. How can you catch air and sell? 
<laughs> so it wasn't easy to put this in their minds until right. the time they started seeing things happen. Was it seeing the beehives or was it seeing the forest come and the rivers come back to life? What was the biggest, you know, persuasive moment or was it all was it was a, a gradual thing? It was a gradual thing. Mm-hmm. It wasn't at once. The project was brought into the community around 2011. Then from there 2013 we started the, the first verification and Oh, now from there mm-hmm. we are to work hard to make sure that the community embraces this project this program understands the concept of the project mm-hmm. and by good through that journey mm-hmm. we were so happy because now the community we can sing the same song we can read from the same page and right. now they understand what we used to tell them they have seen the reality and says Victoria Musioka even these people outside the project area though not officially owners do feel invested in its success these former choppers and charcoalers have become guardians of the forest if they see something like fires you hear people calling me and they ask me we can see fire on the hill what is going to mm-hmm. happen because they are more concerned on what they get from there apart from the meat now right. they ignore they get scholarship Right, and right. it's every year they are getting scholarship so they are, they are much concerned that they may lose what they get there mm-hmm. apart from that their children are getting the advantages of that hill so they are much concerned so much so they keep on calling people those who are much close to the red plus they call us they tell us you check on that area have you noticed the forest cover is it visually different now than it was 10 years ago or Yeah. Like if you describe the landscape how different is this from what it would have, what would have been here the area was so dry mm-hmm. and the ra- the rains were so scarce but nowadays we have seen so much changes it's green and then yeah. it's so it's so clear and it's so fresh yeah if the red plus project goes on i think in years to come the area will be talking something else it will be so mm-hmm. nice for it, mm-hmm. for the people so and we'll never talk about people getting to that hill again victoria musioka closing out this episode of bionic planet brought to you by vera and conservation international if you want more and better episodes you can help me deliver them by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash bionic planet that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash bionic planet there you can support me for as little as a buck an episode and with a monthly cap the address again is patreon.com forward slash bionic planet bionic planet all one word no dots or dashes also if you're an ethical business looking to reach a global and i would say enlightened audience you can advertise on bionic planet or become a sponsor as well you can reach out to me at steve at bionic-planet.com. Finally, you can help just by giving me a five-star review on whichever podcatcher you access me through. That helps because the more stars I get, the more ears I get. And the more ears I get, the more minds we can reach. We can do it if we all work together. And that wraps up today's show. Until next time, I'm Steve Zwick in Chicago. Thanks for listening. <laughs>